morning. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, well, let's talk something about sports and exercise cardiology. And I was asked to uh, talk to you, with you, about sudden cardiac death. Uh, indeed, is a, a, a very uh, big concern in sports. Uh, I declare that I have no conflict of interest. Well, hmm? oh yeah, sure. Uh, may I have the, those lights off, please? Well, um, we can define a sudden cardiac death as a non-traumatic, non-violent, and unexpected natural death of cardiac etiology occurring within one hour of the onset of symptoms in a subject that does, does not have a previously recognized cardiovascular condition. We could call those guys as apparently healthy. Uh, according to this definition, sudden cardiac death may occur during or immediately after the exertions involved in competition or training. And this definition obviously does not include traumas or technical accidents during sports activity. And you, you may probably know that uh, it's an uncommon occurrence, but it's dramatic when it happens because it happens with uh, people that are at least theoretically uh, models of health. We know that not always is that way, but in many occasions, it's, it occurs in crowded stadiums or with real-time TV or internet transmissions. So it becomes more dramatic for this reason. Um, you know that um, it's not a, a very common or frequent occurrence. Uh, it, th this is a, a, an Italian uh, statistics and it's, it, it happens mainly for cardiovascular reasons and the rate is 2.3 athletes per 100,000 athletes per year. And this is a, 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 a North American uh, statistics from, this is the U.S. Natural, National Registry of Sudden Death in Athletes, and it covers a 27-year period. Um, from all deaths in sports, 56% were from cardiovascular causes. And from this, those ones, uh, most of them were due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and coronary artery anomalies in second place. In, um, in third place, it, they would call possible uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It was, there was a hypertrophy, but not the definite uh, diagnosis, and myocarditis comes in, in, in fourth place. Um, you may probably know, uh, sorry, uh, there are any cardiologists here? The, the Spanish lady, anyone? Anyone else? Okay, okay. Uh, you may, but all of you uh, work with sports medicine, right? Okay. Uh, you may probably know that um, in athletes older than 35 year old, um, mostly, maybe somewhat, 80% uh, are due to coronary artery disease. This is the leading cause in master athletes or in senior athletes. But in younger athletes, According to where the data come from, uh, we have two different pictures here. Um, here is from the United States of America, and here is from Italy. Um, here you have the first place with hypertrophic cardio cardiomyopathy in first place, coronary artery anomalies in second place, and myocarditis in third place. But you may probably know that in Italy, there is due to a genetic characteristic of those guys from the northern, uh, maybe from Veneto um, uh, region of Italy, there is a, a greater incidence of arrhythmogenic 
right ventricle um, cardiomyopathy or dysplasia. So this is the leading cause of sudden cardiac death in Italy. Premature uh, coronary artery disease comes in second place and coronary artery anomalies comes in third place. So depending on where the data come from, uh, the, the, the relative incidences may change. So this is a very uh, particular picture of the Italian uh, experience. I would um, ask you some time to make uh, brief comments on the four leading causes of sudden cardiac death. First, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, as you may probably know, there is, this is a genetic myocardial disease and the characteristic is an hypertrophic, not enlarged, left ventricle. That is, and this, card, this hypertrophy is not solely explained by abnormal loading conduction, con conditions. So uh, you have no uh, uh, volume overload or a pressure overload. This uh, hypertrophy seems to be genetically uh, determined. And this is the main cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes in most countries. So the major concerns in this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is first, there is a dynamic obstruction leading to a, a left ventricle to our aortic gradient. So uh, mainly uh, when uh, in resting conditions, you don't have ne necessarily this gradient, but as long as you begin exercising and as long as you enhance, as you uh, aument the intensity of exercise, uh, this hypertrophic septum becomes a kind of uh, 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 dynamic obstruction in the, in the uh, way from the left ventricle to the aorta. So this is a dynamic obstruction uh, leading to this LV to aorta gradient. So uh, many times it may be a cause of syncope in those athletes. You have no gradient in rest, but you do have a gradient uh, in uh, moderate to high intensity exercise. And this uh, LV, uh, left ventricle hypertrophy, is not proportional to the blood supply. So it leads to fibrosis. The fibrosis occurs for two reasons. For this reason, because of this, this uh, unproportional hypertrophy and after because of genetical reasons. So, uh, as you may probably know, the w whenever you have fibrosis with normal myocardium, you have the anatomic substrate for um, some kinds of um, ventricular arrhythmias. So, uh, it's, uh, we, we call it re-entry ventricular arrhythmias that may lead to ventricular tachycardia and this may go to ventricular fibrillation. So this is the mechanism for sudden cardiac death in those patients. So sudden death here is primarily an electric event. The arrhythmogenic uh, right, right ventricle dysplasia is a, also a genetic myocardial disease and it mainly involves the right ventricle with a diffuse or segmental loss of the right ventricle free wall. And it's replaced by fiber fatty tissue. And the myocardial necrosis is not ischemic, not inflammatory, but it seems to be genetically determined. So this kind of construction of the right ventricle wall uh, may uh, cause, is, is the anatomic substrate also for ventricular, re-entry ventricular arrhythmias. So this is the main cause of sudden cardiac death in, in young athletes in Italy. 
mainly in Veneto region. So the major concerns here is that the fiber fatty infiltration is the anatomic substrate for, for reinterventricular arrhythmias. And again, in this case, uh, sudden death is primarily an electric exercise related event. So this is a typical electrocardiogram on those patients. The third, the myocarditis. Well, this is an inflammatory acute disease of the myocardium. Um, mostly, uh, uh, in most cases, it's ha it has a, a viral etiology. And, and I, I can say that it's a very underdiagnosed condition. Many times, the patient or the athlete, whoever, comes to the emergency room with uh, chest pain and he performs some uh, um, tests like a, an electrocardiogram, like enzymes, and many times it's normal. Or many times you have the, the, uh, the altered enzymes and you go to the coronariography and it's normal. And if you don't have an MRI in your hospital, you may probably not diagnose this condition. Well, uh, this is an inflammatory disease, and when you go to, to the MRI room, you can see late, late enhancement in the, in the MRI. So this is the way to, to this is one of the way, maybe the, 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 the most practical way to make this diagnosis in the acute phase. So the problem is that it may progress from an active to a healed phase. And both are associated with the risk of fatal ventricular arrhythmias. So uh, in the acute phase, the major concern is that sudden cardiac death may be caused by ventricular arrhythmias. And this, those arrhythmias may be produced by the myocardial inflammation status. So the myocardium is inflammated and this condition uh, produces uh, the ventricular arrhythmias. But if this is not treated um, in a convenient way or, or mostly if it's not diagnosed, if it's not recognized, it may uh, evolute to a healed phase. And here you will have uh, fibrosis together with normal myocardium. And again, this is the anatomic substrate for reentry ventricular arrhythmias. So this may occur later. Um, in many occasions, we receive uh, athletes or even um, patients that are um, physical, phys physically active. They have, for example, they have palpitations. And we start um, um, making the exams, and we see that they have uh, very frequent ventricular arrhythmias. And when we begin to uh, check why they have those arrhythmias, what happens? Uh, we make the heart monitoring, we, we see uh, polymorphic ventricular arrhythmias, and we go to uh, research mainly for two reasons, for ischemic or for some structural cardiac disease. And when we go to, to the MRI, we see uh, a very particular uh, image of a non-coronary late enhancement in the MRI. So it tells us that that guy, that subject, that patient, that athlete, has had uh, probably a myocarditis some, some, some time in his life or her life, and it was not um, diagnosed, it was not recognized, and it has uh, come to uh, a healed uh, status. So um, this is the cause of anatomic, this is the anatomic substrate for, for reentry ventricular arrhythmias. And this may cause 
problems for the athlete. This may cause uh, sudden cardiac death. This is a major concern. And this is surely a very underdiagnosed condition. And the fourth one, this is the most uh, important cause in senior or master athletes, is coronary artery disease. So this is obviously caused primarily by atherosclerotic disease. And the acute coronary syndrome occurs when the atherosclerotic plaque becomes unstable with the formation of an acute thrombus. So this occurs in about 80% of the sudden cardiac death in over 35 athletes. And, and this is a major concern. Um, it's a silent disease in most subjects. More than 50% of the, the, the patients or the, the people who have coronary artery disease, they will have as the first symptom infarction or sudden death. So it's a, a silent cardiac condition in most patients. And let's remember, uh, I, I don't know, how. Uh, I'm not sure how you work here if only with high performance athletes or with uh, senior athletes as well. But there, in my place, we uh, work with both uh, kinds of athletes. And many times, uh, for example, in Brazil, um, the Master Swimming Athletes Association is very developed and it's very common that we receive over 35 or over 40 or over 50 year old um, people, subjects, athletes to evaluate. And so it's very important to discard completely this kind of situation to clear them for competition. It's a, it's a, a, a different uh, vision when, of, of when we are talking about uh, high performance athletes. So um, here again, sudden cardiac death is primarily an electric event. So the, the, the substrate is anatomic and the occurrence is when you, the, the, the subject have ventricular tachycardia that goes to ventricular fibrillation. This is, in most cases, the, the mechanism, mechanism for sudden cardiac death. So, to minimize this risk is a very uh, challenge, very big challenge for sports cardiology. Um, this is to be reminded. Um, this is an electric phenomenon in athletes with structural or ischemic cardiac disease. I like this paragraph for, from the Brazilian Society of Sports and Exercise Medicine guideline on sudden cardiac death. And it says that many times sudden cardiac death is an event that may be prevented. And one strategy for this prevention is a specific medical evaluation for job subjects that are involved in regular practice of physical exercise of competi or competitive sports. Um, so how do we treat it? We have two uh, extremes. In the first extreme, um, we have this uh, graph of survival rate according to the time elapsed from uh, sudden cardiac death by ventricular fibrillation until defibrillation. And as you may see here, every minute we lost about 7% in our success rate of um, bringing that athlete or that patient back. So time is very important here. So um, many um, institutions or many um, sports medicine associations, they say that the availability of automated external defibrillators in a sports facility is, is, is stimulated in order to minimize the time between the recognition of the cardiac arrest and the effective defibrillation. So, according to this, if you have 10 minutes 
your success rate is very, very low. So you have to act as soon as possible. Um, this is in one extreme. But on the other side, in the prevention side, in, uh, in order not to, to, to make it, not to let it happen, there is the pre-participation evaluation. This is very important. This is a very uh, interesting strategy, not for uh, only not only for um, assuring a good conditions for performance, but also for giving the athlete the possibility of having um, safety for this performance. So this is important instrument for, for a healthy and safe exercise and sports performance. And the main objective is to assess how eligible the athlete is for sports practice. And let's remember that um, when, we, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, pre-participation evaluation, we generally uh, think on young adult athletes, but in many occasions, we may be working with children and adolescents, and as I told you later, uh, earlier, with over 35-year-old adults and senior citizens like this. Uh, I have a, a, one of my patients, uh, is, he's 84-year-old. Uh, he is a very good swimmer. He's top three in Fina's ranking in nine different disciplines. And he's a coronary artery patient. He had an infarction more than 20 years ago. He was told not to swim anymore, not to compete anymore. And we have evaluated him and we have proposed to him. You may compete, but you may not have ventricular arrhythmias, you may not have ischemia. So we begin, began to, to uh, adjust his medical treatment. Uh, he, he, he has an, a coronary anatomy that, that does not allow any kind of intervention. So we, have to, we had to um, make adjustments in his medical treatment so that he is very, very, very stable. He does not have any kind of ischemia in, in, in the, the exercise centigraphy. He has no ventricular arrhythmias at all. So this, uh, th this way he can compete in a very safe way. Um, he, he has been, uh, he, 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 we, we know him because he's uh, uh, the father of our colleague in the hospital. And uh, um, his profile is like this. Uh, he, he uses competition to become uh, active, to, to, to maintain his, his, himself active. And if we said, if we told him he could not train anymore, he could not compete anymore, it would be worse for him for his, his health. So we, we try to, to create the conditions for him to go on competing, but in a very, very safe way. And we have to uh, remember that we have different profiles for evalu evaluation. For example, regular physical exercise for an apparently healthy subject or for a patient who, for whom the, the exercise is being used in the treatment or to competitive sports. So th those kinds of uh, uh, pre-participation evaluations are different according to the, the profile of the athlete or, or the, of the subject we are evaluating. So um, here we have the anamnesis. Th this is very, very easy for everyone. But uh, we have to pay attention to uh, some cardiovascular symptoms like uh, syncope, for example. Um, an athlete with syncope, uh, he, he or she must be very, very carefully um, evaluated. And this syncope, uh, may, it, it, it's important that we consider that occurrence as uh, an episode of aborted sudden cardiac death until proven in the contrary. So we have to always check for a rhythmogenic etiology. And uh, if you, most of you, uh, work with athletes, with high performance athletes, and many, probably many of you has, has been 
athletes too. So uh, you may probably know that this kind of symptoms like dyspnea, dizziness, lipo lipothemia, chest discomfort, palpitations, and asthenia, um, those sensations may be normal sensations of a very high intensity training or in a competition. So it's very important that we sports physician have, uh, have a, a very um, accurate sensitivity to check if this is a normal sensations, sensation of a competition or if it's a symptom that may lead to a diagnosis that may uh, save that athlete. So um, here you have three articles that report that in the week before the occurrence of an event like sudden cardiac death, uh, the athlete has had reported in 21, in the case of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 37% in the case of coronary anomalies, and in 54% in the case of arrhythmogenic right ventricle cardiomyopathy. Symptoms that had not been uh, properly evaluated by the, the medical team or by the trainer or by, by the, the, the professionals who were working with the athlete. So in many occasions, um, the athlete comes to you with a complaint and you must uh, have a very accurate sensitivity to, to, to check if this is something to be valued or not. Um, going on in anamnesis, like uh, we have to ask for family disease, uh, cases of early sudden death in the family, congenital cardiac diseases, sickle cell anemia, this is a, a concern in many, many parts of Brazil, uh, mainly with uh, African uh, American, um, African origin athletes, and coronary artery disease, hypertension, family histories, and diabetes too. And the social history is very important. Uh, this is not very common to, to have high-performance athletes using tobacco, but um, many of them use re recreational drugs, and this is something to be evaluated to, to, give, him, to give them uh, the, the proper advice. Um, also, some supplements. Uh, you know that uh, many supplements are contaminated not necessarily with uh, substances that uh, can be found on the box, but um, you may probably know that the IOC made a, 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 has executed a, an analysis or of more than 800 supplements in all the world, and the mean rate of contamination was about 20 to 21% of the, 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 the supplements. Contamination with uh, forbidden substances for not permitted substances in WADA list that are not shown in the box. So this is a very major, major concern and this may, uh, in some profiles of athletes, may lead to sudden cardiac death too mainly with stimulants, for example, that may be present with no, um, uh, no uh, w w without being in, in the box. So this, after clinical examination, uh, we go to the diagnostic tests. Uh, Jomar was telling me that you have a, a routine here of a laboratory tests, and uh, one discussion is about ECG if it's obligatory or not. Um, so what would be considered a minimum standard? Uh, you may probably know that Italian experience in, since 1982, the Italian law determines that every subject engaged in competitive sports activity must undergo a clinical evaluation to obtain eligibility before entering, before competing. And this is more uh, about 10 percent of the overall Italian population. It's a, a, a huge work they, they do there. 
And the protocol is very simple. Medical history, physical examination, and rest ECG. And this uh, produces a very interesting um, results. You see here, 1982, when the, the law began, this is the rate of sudden cardiac death in athletes in Italy, and this is in the overall population. So you see here the difference in 1982 coming to the 2000 uh, to a very, very similar rate of the uh, overall population. And this is the comparison of sudden cardiac death uh, cases in Italy, in the Veneto region, and in one uh, state of the uh, United States, in Minnesota, showing that since 1982, the rate, the incidence has decreased in a very, very, um, uh, very uh, clear way. Um, maybe, uh, I'm not sure if every one is, is, is familiar with uh, electrocardiogram in athletes, but what we see in our hospital is that the, the cardiologist that does not work with athletes, may, many times he or she is not um, accustomed to the modifications of the athlete's electrocardiogram. This is a, a typical athlete electro, electrocardiogram with tall picket T waves like here, with U waves like this. And many times it may be mis un, un, misinterpreted as pathological uh, modifications of the electrocardiogram, mainly related to uh, coronary artery disease. But this is typical from uh, an athlete, uh, the, the, the electrocardiogram of an athlete. So this is an IOC uh, document that also um, says that anamnesis, clinical examination, electrocardiogram are mandatory, and exercise testing and echocardiogram would be performed in case of abnormalities. So um, this is a very, very interesting concern. Uh, should we perform uh, electrocardiogram? According to our experience here and also in Brazil, uh, we, we, we um, say that there are two visions. Uh, the United States say that it's not to be uh, made in all athletes because the the cost, um, the, 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 the relation between the cost and the benefit is not, uh, does not justify the, the, the electrocardiogram in all athletes. They are concerned. Uh, they, they, the, the Americans say that you have to, uh, to, to make too many electrocardiograms and to, to spend too much money to save one life. That's the, the, their point. And the Europeans say it's worth it because uh, we can save lives on that. Um, probably 80 to 90 percent of the hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy uh, people have an altered, uh, changed uh, electrocardiogram. So uh, this is one thing to be to be made in not athletes. And we also know uh, that echocardiogram is very important to, to discard some cardiac, um, structural cardiac diseases. And the exercise testing is very interesting also, mainly in the over 35-year-old uh, athletes because of the risk for silent ischemia, for silent coronary artery disease. But the Exercise testing, mainly if it's cardiopulmonary, it may uh, give some information that may be important also for the training uh, regimen of the athlete. You know that uh, by the specificity principle, uh, we have to, uh, to, to, to perform the exercise testing in the most specific way that is possible. So for a cyclist, 
you can use that for maybe for a swimmer, something like that. Maybe for a rower, something like that, and so on. So the more specific you can be, the best for your athlete. And when everything is normal, it's good. The athlete is eligible to, for competition. But the problem is when a cardiac condition is di diagnosed. So what can we do about that? Uh, to answer the, this question, I would ask you again. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most frequent cause of uh, sudden cardiac death in young athletes. So I would ask you, is an athlete with this condition eligible for sports competition? What would you say to me? Yes, no, maybe, perhaps, depends on, depends on what. Let's see. When answering this question, may the athlete with cardiovascular disease compete, we have to consider the cardiac disease, the sport modality, and the specialty in the sport. For example, in soccer, it's different being a goalkeeper, a midfielder, or a wing. The, 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 the physiological requirements are very different. For an uh, athlete, for, for, for example, it's a 100 or a marathon athlete. And the swimming, it's a, a 50, uh, 100 or 100 meters, or it's a, a 1,050, 500 meters. So the, 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 the athletes are different. Uh, Maybe uh, the, the Spanish lady here, the cardiologist, know that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if all of you know, the, you may probably know the Bethesda document. There is a, a specific document for uh, sports competition in athletes with cardiovascular disease. Um, it's very interesting to see the classification of sports and the sports are classified according to the intensity of the static component in low, moderate, and high, and the intensity of the dynamic component in low, moderate, and high. So we have nine different classifications. Let's pass by it very, very uh, fastly. The 1A, the low static component in the first line and the low dynamic component in the first row here, um, we have sports like bowling, like cricket, th there is very popular uh, among Indian uh, origin athletes. Curling, no, it's very popular in winter sports. Golf, riflery, and yoga. This is 1B classification, low static component here, and moderate dynamic component. You have uh, sports like baseball, fencing, softball, table tennis, and volleyball. And pay attention to those ones here. There are uh, sports w where um, there is a danger of bodily collision. Bodily collision among opponents or bodily collision um, uh, with uh, balls and, and, and instruments and so on. And this is, uh, this is very important to to pay attention, uh, mainly in athletes who are in use of anti-aggregant anti uh, uh, agents or with anticoagulants. So this is very important to, to consider. 1C, you have low static component here in the first row and high dynamic component here in the third column. Badminton, cross-country skiing, field hockey, orienteering, race walking, and racquetball, squash, and running, and soccer. Here in 2A, moderate state, static component and low dynamic component here, you have archery, auto racing, diving, equestrian, and motorcycling. And this sign shows sports in which there is an increased risk if syncope occurs. And one of my patients uh, is a uh, racing pilot, and one time once he uh, complained of, of dizziness during the race and when he was about to uh, to make a curve in w about 
250 kilometers per hour, he nearly fainted. So this, is may, this may be catastrophic. So we have to, to evaluate this athlete very, very carefully. 2B, moderate static and moderate dynamic component. You have those sports here. 2C, moderate stat static component, high dynamic component. Those sports here, like basketball, swimming, and so on. 3A, high static component and low dynamic component, like the, those sports here. 3B, high static component and moderate dynamic component. And finally, 3C, high static and dynamic component, like uh, boxing, the catlon, triathlon, and so on. So this classification allows us to uh, see the sports how they are. There are very, very different sports. And according to the, to the sport, according to the condition, to the cardiac condition, you may uh, make some uh, recommendations. So this question again, is an athlete with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy eligible for sports competition? What would you tell me? Yes, no, depends on or none of the above. So, clearly, depends on. Depends on. Are there symptoms? Yes or no? Is there any subaortic gradient? If so, how much? Is there late gadolinium enhancement in cardiac MRI? If so, there is an increased risk for cardiac arrhythmias. And depends on the sport also. Um, <coughs> At least th theoretically, uh, the athletes with this cardiac condition may compete in 1A sports, like bowling, cricket, curling, golf, riflery, and yoga. So uh, they must not necessarily be withdrawn for all sports, but those sports may be performed with safety by those kinds of, of patients. So. As a conclusion, how to prevent sudden cardiac death in sports and exercise? First, by having automatic, auto automated er external defibrillators and health sports professionals with CPR training in training and competition facilities. Second, by performing pre-participation clinical evaluation to identify causes of sudden cardiac death and to withdraw or redirect athletes with cardiovascular disease, and also to enhance performance and at the same time safety. So what is mandatory? Anamnesis, clinical examination, and rest electrocardiogram. What would I, uh, I call highly recommended? Clinical exercise testing and echo-doppler cardiogram. But those are mandatory if we find rest electrocardiogram abnormalities or if the athlete has symptoms or clinical examination abnormalities suggestive of cardiovascular diseases. And also for over 35-year-old subjects who are candidates for competitive sports. Some, uh, some suggestions here. Uh, this is the, the last Bethesda conference, the 36th from 2005. This is a very similar European uh, document that can be found in, the, in the, the website of the European Society of Cardiology. This is what I would call the Bethesda Update 2015, although it has not uh, the name Bethesda anymore, but it, it's a very similar document that has been published in circulation in, in 2015. You, you can find it in the American Heart Association website. Uh, we also have in Brazil the joint position statement of the Brazilian Society of Cardiology and the Brazilian Society of Sports and Exercise Medicine. Uh, and there is, there is also an, an English version uh, too. This is very, uh, a very complete uh, document in which we have uh, participated too. This is the South American Confederation of Sports Medicine position statement also. And I would end just asking you if you find genetics important. Here it comes.
Probably genetics. The right genes make all the difference. Yeah, right genes make all the difference. But but I like this movie, this small movie too, just to tell you that when we are we medical doctors are in our hospital, in our office, and we receive uh, an athlete, a patient, and in many occasions that athlete or that patient is apparently healthy as this guy, this little guy, was apparent, apparent, uh, uh, apparently not offensive or not dangerous. But when we are working and when we are committed to give our patient or our athlete the most he or she can have in performance and also in safety, we have to make always the right thing. And the, always the right thing is to make, to perform a very complete pre-participation evaluation. This will give the athlete safety and performance at the same time. Uh, let me remind you about, uh, about the 35th FEMS World Congress of Sports Medicine that is going to be held in September in Rio de, de, de Janeiro, Brazil. And we would be very honored to welcome all of you in our city, Rio de Janeiro, in September. Thank you very much. <laughs>